March 1, 1997. This is the launch date of the Nintendo 64 in Australia. Yes, I'm aware that it launched in 96 in North America and Japan, but back in those days, I was a very poor college student and there was no way that I could afford the price to import a system from overseas. But it didn't matter. When the Nintendo 64 did launch in Australia, it changed my life. I fell in love with the hardware and it truly felt like the biggest generational leap in hardware ever. Now, of course, many could argue the case here that the PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 2 or the Saturn to the Dreamcast was even more technologically impressive. But for me personally, going from the Super NES to the N64 was a massive generational leap and it truly transformed video games into a new dimension, literally. But there was always something about the N64 that bothered me. This port labeled Memory Expansion. Taking the top off reveals what is known as a jumper pack. Do not remove jumper pack from control deck, the sticker claimed. But I always wondered, what is the purpose of this memory expansion port? After all, all my games at the time ran just fine without any expansion. But as it turns out, this would be the home for the Nintendo 64 expansion pack which simply adds an additional four megabytes of RAM to the hardware, bringing it up to a total of eight megabytes. The expansion pack released in 1998 and was originally meant for the ill-fated 64DD, but Nintendo moved forward and released it for the Nintendo 64 to take advantage of cartridge games. And while there is a moderate selection of games that do take advantage of the expansion, almost every game in the Nintendo 64 library simply doesn't require one. And this, along with the Sega Saturn back in 1995, was the very first time I can ever remember a game console ever making use of expanded memory. Now, as someone that grew up with home computers in my household, I was very familiar with what RAM expansions were. Coming from the Amiga 500, having an additional 512 kilobytes of memory added to the A500 back in the day opened up a ton of new games that I couldn't play without it. What I loved about this was that when you loaded some games when you had the extra RAM, it would display an image that the extra RAM was detected. It truly made you feel like a power user. But a RAM expansion on a game console like the N64, what is even the purpose? After all, game consoles have a fixed hardware spec and every developer needs to work within those conditions. If the N64 has four megabytes on board, then all games must run within those four megabytes of memory, correct? Well, not exactly. As it turns out, there was a grand total of two games that actually required the Nintendo 64 expansion pack, Donkey Kong 64 and Majora's Mask. These two games required the expansion pack and would not work without it. A third game, Perfect Dark, did on the box advertise that the expansion pack was required. However, it could still run without one, offering about 35% of the complete game. And this was something that was advertised on the back of the box. If you didn't have the expansion pack, then you were out of luck. If you did, then you had access to the entire game. Nintendo was very smart to not actually require the expansion pack in games immediately, and it was something that they introduced with Donkey Kong 64. In other words, they were far more forward thinking. They waited almost a year before making the memory pack available. This meant that if you wanted access to high fidelity graphics, faster frame rates, and more content, then you would be more inclined to purchase the expansion pack. Now let's talk about DK64 in some detail. It's a 3D platform action adventure game which as Donkey Kong, you explore an island and collect items to progress through mini games and puzzles. Now this game itself is very polarizing. Some people love DK64, many people hate it as the worst collectathon ever in video games, but that is beside the point. Nintendo themselves spent 22 million marketing DK64 as the big holiday game of 1999. And it was the very first game that not only required the expansion pack, it even came bundled with the game itself. So no one was left behind. Now let's address the elephant in the room. Exactly how does DK64 make use of this expansion pack? If we look at the game on face value, it's an impressive looking game, no question. But it's really not any more impressive than say Conker's Bad Fur Day, another rare Nintendo 64 title that really pushed the hardware to its limits, which didn't use the expansion pack. And there is a long-standing myth that the expansion pack 
was used in DK64 to address a memory leak which would end up crashing the game after a few hours of play. So the solution then was just to bundle the 4 meg expansion pack with every single copy of DK64, effectively mitigating the issue itself. Now it is important to note here that the term memory leak was never used by Rare themselves. They called it a game breaking glitch or a bug. Now before we proceed and dive deeper into this topic, I do think it's important to illustrate to you guys what a memory leak is with a real world example. So let's go ahead and take a look at that right now. Now to best explain what a memory leak is in its truest form, I've got this very, very simple program here. And basically when this runs, it's going to go into a loop and it's going to run continuously until I break out of the program. And what this program is doing is very simple. It's allocating a piece of memory to store four bytes or the size of an integer and then it's assigning that integer to the value 15 and then printing that out to the screen. The underlying root cause for this is that we're allocating a block of memory, but we're never freeing it up. And we keep allocating memory in a loop, but it never gets freed. And in this particular example, only after a few seconds of running this program, even though we're only allocating four bytes on a loop, you can see that we're already exceeding about 80 megabytes of usage. And over time, after a few hours of usage, this will be a lot higher. We're into the gigabytes at that point. And eventually we're going to start running out of system memory. Now remember the Nintendo 64 only has four megabytes. So something as simple as this, some oversight, could really be catastrophic. But I'm here to tell you that this memory leak expansion pack myth is simply not true. And here's why. Deadlines in video games are a real thing. Trust me, I know. But I'm also familiar with the certification process or lot check as Nintendo calls it. Games are tested thoroughly, including what is known as soak tests, where the game is left running for many, many hours to see what the behavior is, including memory leakage. Nintendo would have most certainly picked up on it. And even with the Christmas deadline looming, it's hard to believe that just by adding the memory pack expansion that this problem would simply be fixed. First of all, adding more memory wouldn't fix the issue at all. It would only prolong it. But let's play devil's advocate for a second and assume that this actually was the case. Since then, in the world of YouTube, there is simply no video evidence of the game crashing after prolonged use. As well as this, there is no patched ROM that lets you play the game in four megabytes. Furthermore, this would be something that DK64 speedrunners would have picked up on years ago, and it simply doesn't exist. Despite the Nintendo 64's limitation and the fairly early onset of 3D technology, it was one of the very first Nintendo 64 games that actually featured dynamic lights. So when you walked into a new area, there was a lot going on. And you can see this pretty much early on from the beginning of the game itself. And the most compelling thing here is that according to Simon Craddock, one of four engineers who worked on DK64, the extra RAM was only ever used to take advantage of ongoing improvements in technology, specifically more advanced vertex lighting. And the final piece of this is that there is an ongoing reverse engineering effort for DK64 right now. And it's very apparent that the memory map of the game featured almost the entire set of eight megabytes. So the concept of a memory leak restricting Donkey Kong 64's release without an expansion pack is simply false. But outside of these two required games, the expansion pack did a pretty decent job of enhancing games with over 60 titles supporting it. Ask any developer out there and they will tell you that having more RAM is always welcome. It allows features and enhancements that were simply just not possible without. And since Nintendo opened up the expansion pack support to many games that were in development, developers would use the expansion pack in some pretty interesting ways. The first and most common method was to increase resolutions, but in many scenarios, this would come at the expense of reduced frame rates. This is because increasing the frame buffer needs more time to render a complete frame. The Nintendo 64 supports a maximum resolution of 640x480. Most games with high resolution support never actually hit this mark. Take for example Turok 2. Its internal resolution is running at 320x240, but with the expansion pack it introduces a high res 480x360 mode. The effect is a much cleaner game, but once again at the expense of a frame rate, and in some parts of the game it's quite noticeable. FIFA 99 is another game that also supports a super high resolution mode, and this is running at 640x480, and it does look very clean, but look how much choppier the gameplay is in this mode. Vigilante 8 is a game that's basically a ripoff of Twisted Metal, and one game that I actually quite enjoyed back in the day. It has a hidden 640x480 mode by typing in max resolution in the game's cheat code section. Once again, 
the visuals are much sharper, but the performance is significantly reduced. But I don't think it's a fair thing to say that all games that use the expansion pack and high resolution modes will have frame rate issues. There are definitely some outliers. For example, Resident Evil 2 is one of the more fascinating games on the N64 that we have covered before. But did you know the expansion pack increases resolutions from the standard 320x240 all the way up to 640x480 with different resolutions that intentionally are set based on the number of enemies in the room. This has the effect of really enhancing visuals and makes the expansion pack the very best way to experience Resident Evil 2. And I think this could be considered a very early onset of what we would consider dynamic resolution switching, which is really cool. Now, of course, with a modern capture device like the RetroTINK 4K that I'm using here, to handle screen resolution switchings on the fly, while it does a pretty good job, you'll still notice a slight pause and of course this message on the top right hand side that's telling us what the current resolution is. This of course wasn't anything that the original development team was even thinking about when outputting the game on a CRT, and there are no such issues there. The other game that comes to mind that has a high resolution mode that doesn't affect frame rate is Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. By enabling high res mode, it bumps resolution to 400 by 440. It even unlocks a level 13 King Souls mine. This resolution increase looks very clean, and I do love how much better the game is. And Factor 5, of course, are the masters of the Nintendo 64. And if there were any frame rate drops here, they are very well concealed, because I personally haven't noticed any at all. Another interesting use case for the expansion pack is to keep screen resolutions as they are, but instead increase texture quality. And this approach not only can lead to improvements in visual quality, but it can also improve frame rates. Quake 2 is a very good example of this. In the base mode, the game looks like it's running at a standard res with very low resolution textures. Nice and blurry as we would expect, but the frame rate is pretty good. But then with the expansion pack, you'll notice that the resolution hasn't changed at all. However, the texture detail has, and not only this, additional optimizations have been done to also improve frame rates. Quake 2 on the N64 is probably one of the very best reasons to get a N64 expansion pack, and it really does benefit from the additional memory. Another great example of increased fidelity is 007 The World Is Not Enough. You can really notice the difference in quality when switching between the standard and the high color mode with the expansion pack enabled. Another method to provide an enhanced experience with the memory pack was to simply use the additional memory to add new functionality to existing games. And one of the best examples that I can remember is Gauntlet Legends. Now this game is a pretty faithful conversion from the arcade. But if you want to play four player co-op, it's only available with the expansion pack and that extra memory facilitates having four players on screen at once. Hydro Thunder is another example of this. The expansion pack is required for three and four player multiplayer. Otherwise, without the expansion pack, it can only be up to a two player game. And finally, some games use the expansion pack in ways that really benefit the overall performance, but in subtle ways. And a great example of this are the acclaimed sports games such as All-Star Baseball. With the expansion pack loaded, there is a lot of pre-fetching and pre-loading of data that's being loaded in and decompressed ahead of time. And usually this was done when the title screen was being displayed. Now overall, performance is improved because there is a lot of data that's already in memory, which result in a better frame rate. But this was something that was quite subtle. Now if you didn't have an expansion pack, the game still looked and ran very, very well, but code and data was being swapped in and decompressed as needed. So this definitely was a lesser overall experience. And in conclusion, the N64 expansion pack is a very interesting device. And in many ways, it's a pointless peripheral that really outside of the three games, it didn't really make too much sense to have. But there's definitely some compelling reasons why you would have needed one, especially if you wanted the very best that the Nintendo 64 could offer. Was it a necessary device to have? Absolutely not, but I'm very glad it exists and it really does show what interesting and creative things developers could do with an extra bit of RAM. But we are going to leave it here for today's episode guys. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know your favorite N64 game and if there was any benefit from the memory pack, please let me know because I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this topic as well. But thank you so much for watching, guys. We're going to leave it here. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode.
Bye for now.